This micro lecture is a bioenergy industry overview. As we begin our discussion about bioenergy conversion processes that are used and will be used industrially, I would like everyone to consider some of the irony around biofuels for vehicles and the horse-drawn carriage. I have attached a link with some amusing images that you can look at if you like. Armies of people spend millions of dollars a year trying to recreate what a horse does chemically and mechanically. In some ways, a horse is the ultimate bioenergy-powered vehicle. Grass and water go in, power and locomotion come out. Sure, the efficiency isn't great, and you have to keep fueling it even when you aren't using it, but it certainly is powered by biomass and capable of allowing us to drive around. Worth thinking about. Please take a moment and review this week's learning objectives. These biomass conversion pathways are the four common denominators of the bioenergy industry. Most bioenergy ideas and businesses use combinations of different conversion processes and then come up with a cool name for it that gets attention because it's marketable. They add bio or thermo or chemical to all kinds of words and it can get very confusing. When someone tells you about a bioenergy conversion process, you need to be able to identify the basic parts. There are generally only four possibilities, thermal conversions, chemical conversions, biological conversions, and mechanical conversions. Almost every known bioenergy process will fall into one or more of these categories. You will not be responsible for understanding all of the various details of each conversion type, but you will be responsible for developing a basic understanding that allows you to identify them when evaluating bioenergy news and developments. The first pathway we will learn about is mechanical conversions. These include crushing oily biomass, densification, chipping and grinding, and drying. This is an especially important conversion because biomass is a solid and that means it almost always has to be turned into a different kind of solid, liquid, or gas to be used. This is much, much harder from a conversion perspective than the challenges you face when your feedstock is a liquid or a gas, like fossil fuels. You must consider the changes a tree has to go through to become a piece of paper. Sure, chemical reactions are used to make the pulp, but otherwise, 90% of the entire process from tree to paper is mechanical, and it is very complicated and expensive. Unfortunately, many new bioenergy companies overlook the importance and challenges of mechanical conversion, and it leads to their downfall. A good understanding of mechanical conversions is an important part of understanding how to utilize biomass for energy. Densification is a big deal. Turning low-density, unpredictable biomass into high-density, predictable biomass makes a better fuel and allows us to make better wood stoves and engineer more advanced wood heating systems. Densification has become an extremely important part of the bioenergy community. We now ship hundreds of millions of dollars in wood pellets to Europe every year. Chipping and grinding is equally important. Turning big biomass into small biomass is absolutely required for most conversion processes. Trees have to be reduced in size to be transported, and logs have to be reduced in size to be used for building. In the bioenergy world, this dramatically increases the price of biomass, but it is a cost that must be paid to use biomass. So we will spend some time talking about this technology. The second pathway we will learn about is thermal conversions. Thermal conversions and mechanical conversions make up the bulk of biomass conversions that occur in the world at any given moment. From a chemical perspective, thermal conversions are the hammer. They are pretty insensitive about the source of carbon, but what they make can be messy. Without question, the most widespread conversion from an energy perspective is thermal because of combustion. We live on a planet full of oxygen, and combustion is king when it comes to making energy. A close look at the graph makes it fairly clear. Combustion is an oxidation reaction, and oxidation is one of the easiest, cheapest, and most powerful chemical reactions on Earth. Its dominance in heat and energy production is not chance. No other technology currently comes close in terms of power density and specific power. To the extent that we can gain more control of oxidation reactions, like fuel cells, thermochemical processes will continue to play an important role in our energy future. 
From this point forward, when we think about thermal conversions, it will be important to think about heat and oxygen. This is because heat and oxygen almost completely control what kind of thermal conversion will occur. As you add more oxygen and more heat to the process, you get different types of thermal conversion. The lowest level of conversion is pyrolysis. It requires no oxygen and just enough heat to start getting biomass molecules to break, so around 400 degrees Celsius. The middle level of conversion is gasification. It requires more heat than pyrolysis, but importantly, it requires the addition of a small amount of oxygen. Not enough to combust, but enough to lead to the formation of partially oxidized gas products. The highest level of conversion is combustion. When you give the system all the oxygen it can handle and enough heat to set it off, it combusts, just like a match. Another interpretation of this graph has to do with heat release. Assuming the temperature of the system is in the pyrolysis zone of 400 Celsius or more, addition of oxygen will cause the biomass to leave pyrolysis and go to gasification, and then with more oxygen, move on to combustion. However, each thermal process releases heat as well. So in pyrolysis, a small amount of heat is generated, then in gasification, more heat is generated, and then in combustion, the most heat is generated. This is a very useful graph for understanding thermal conversions. Every time you strike a match, you achieve 1500 degrees Celsius, roughly the melting point of steel. I am always amazed that every time I look at a candle or light a match, I am looking at a reaction that is generating temperatures of 1500 degrees Celsius. That's over 2700 degrees Fahrenheit. Considering this helps me appreciate how much potential energy is available in carbon. Pyrolysis and gasification have been around a long time. When we discussed history, we discussed the use of biomass in World War II for powering vehicles. This was a thermal conversion that turned biomass into a vapor form that could be used by internal combustion engines. The exact thermal conversion was usually gasification, but occasionally it was pyrolysis. We will learn about both. Pathway 3 is chemical conversions, and it will be split into two main parts, breaking biomass down into its pieces, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, and breaking those pieces down into chemicals and fuels. From the chemical perspective, chemical conversions are like the knife, as opposed to the thermal hammer. Chemical conversions are more sensitive to the type of biomass, but they are accurate and precise like a knife and as a result they can produce a very high quality predictable product. This pathway is important because we can expose biomass to many different kinds of chemicals and conditions and get it to turn into a variety of things. It is important that you have a general appreciation for what some of those chemicals, conditions, and steps are so that you can better understand the developments in the bioenergy industry. Biomass is largely composed of cell walls, and these cell walls can be disassembled elegantly using acids, bases, alcohols, ketones, and other solvents. Biochemical processes can be complicated, but acids and solvents are powerful and work based on kinetics that are predictable and can be modeled with impressive confidence. To the extent that reasonably homogeneous feedstocks are utilized, these processes will always be competitive in the production of biofuels and biochemicals. We have been using chemical conversions to turn biomass into useful products for a very, very long time. The conversion of wood chips into cellulose pulp for paper is a chemical conversion known as pulping. You can pulp any kind of plant biomass to produce cellulose, but not all the cellulose is good for making paper. Once we break down the biomass into the cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, we usually have to break those components down even further to get what we want, which is chemicals and fuels that function in our existing systems. One of the chemicals in highest demand is sugar, another one is phenol, and a third is furfural. I may have mentioned this before, but we are addicted to organic chemistry, so better ways of producing certain organic chemicals are always of interest, and chemical conversions are very good at making very high quality chemicals. Anything that can digest plants or fungus is using a chemical conversion to make sugars, including us. We are all using biomass chemical conversions right now, and we have recently done a biomass mechanical conversion. 
Every time you cut your food to eat it, and every time you chew it before swallowing, you are doing a mechanical conversion. You reduced the food size to get it into the reactor, your mouth. Then you chewed it so that it could be broken down easier in your stomach. So technically, you had to perform two mechanical conversions. Likewise, two chemical conversions also occurred. As soon as you began chewing the biomass, you began adding enzymes in your saliva. Enzymes are just a fancy protein chemical, and when they're added to the food, they begin the breakdown process. Then, after you swallowed the biomass, it was conveyed down your throat and into a special reactor where it began the second chemical conversion by being broken down in a 98 degree Fahrenheit hydrochloric acid bath, also known as your stomach. The biomass is broken down enough by these mechanical and chemical conversions that it can be used as a source of nutrition for living organisms like us. Thank goodness it's designed so well. Just like the digestion analogy, cellulosic ethanol is like a refined, robotic, industrial cow stomach. This, of course, is an oversimplification, but it's fairly accurate and provides an example just about everybody can understand. Breaking biomass into its parts, and breaking those parts into chemicals and fuels, really focuses on the biomass cell wall. But as we have discussed, biomass isn't all cell wall, and it can be squeezed to produce oils in some cases. These oils get turned into fuels using their own class of chemical conversions. For example, biodiesel is produced using a chemical reaction called transesterification. This actually adds more oxygen to the fatty acid to turn it into a good fuel. Renewable diesel is produced by any chemical process that removes oxygen from the natural fat or oil and makes a chemical known as a paraffin or olefin. This is like high-tech, supercharged vegetable oil hydrogenation. Likewise, hydrogenated vegetable oil has, has been commercially produced for at least 50 years, and while we use it for food, it can also make a great fuel. Finally, saponification is the reaction that makes soap from vegetable oil. It's always ironic to think that we use a special form of oil to clean oil off our bodies. Like dissolves like. One of the best available biological sources of oil is canola. You can get about 100 gallons per acre on a good year. While canola is a great oil plant, 100 gallons an acre doesn't seem like that much unless you're a farmer. Pathway 4 is biological conversions, and it will be split into fermentations, photosynthetic organisms, and animals. From the commercial perspective, biological conversions are like having an aquarium. It is technically an ecosystem, so you have to consider all the angles and how things will get along. You have to keep everything alive by feeding it and making sure the conditions are correct, and most importantly, you have to keep it wet. Living things don't do dry well. So biological conversions range from wet to completely submerged. Like your aquarium, water is a must. Of the biological conversions available to us, arguably fermentation is used the most for chemicals production. Fermentation is generally the act of feeding microbes in a low oxygen environment so that they will start producing things we want. A lot of microbes can live in oxygen-rich or oxygen-lean environments, but they produce very different things depending on what they are living in, and when it's low oxygen, they must start using fermentation pathways. Fermentations can produce a very, very wide range of products from an even wider range of microbes, and they are extremely important in the bioenergy community. A very common fermentation is anaerobic digestion, like what happens at your local landfill or in your compost pile. According to the EPA, each American generates approximately one ton of waste per year. Depending on how you look at it, this is either a tremendous source of gas or an unsustainable solution, since approximately 10 tons of waste biomass makes enough natural gas for one house a year. So unless your household has 10 people, and all of the waste goes to anaerobic digestion, your household is unlikely to be able to produce enough natural gas for a year from its own biomass waste. Photosynthetic organisms, like algae and plants, do not need to be fed sugar or kept in a low oxygen environment like fermentation microbes. 
They produce their own sugars using photosynthesis, and they do not really need oxygen as much as they need carbon dioxide. Photosynthetic organisms can be high-tech like algae used for fuels and oils, or low-tech like canola and peanut plants that are used to produce vegetable oils. Likewise, animals are their own class because they require oxygen and can be fed more complicated forms of biomass that haven't yet been turned into sugar. Mammals tend to produce oils in the form of fats, which are often converted into oils after harvesting. Insects have long been used to produce chemicals and are quickly gaining interest as a source of oils as well. The noble tunicate, a funky-looking, slimy filter feeder found in cold oceans, may also become a fascinating new source of cellulose sugars. Like grains, animals are often overlooked in all the bioenergy media, and this is unfortunate because they currently play a role and will likely continue to play an increasing role in the biological conversion of biomass into useful chemicals and fuels. Microbes are tiny little factories. You provide the house and food, and they provide more factories, and also some product. It is imperative that we remember when we use biological conversions that living things do not exist to produce things for us. They can produce things for us if we feed them and provide a healthy environment, but they exist to replicate, not to make chemicals. We find chemicals in and around certain living things, but they are by no means an engineered process like chemical and thermal conversions. Please review the four common denominators of the bioenergy industry. We always think about petroleum oil spills, but never about vegetable oil spills. Vegetable oil can be just as harmful to marine life as petroleum if it is spilled in major quantities. To date, there have been very few of these spills, but it is still worth thinking about. Oil is oil regardless of whether it is from a fossil or vegetable source. When you have a chance, please take a look at the attached links that describe a vegetable oil spill scare that happened in Alaska a few years ago.